the NHS. The NHS is the third biggest employer in the world, an unmanageable monster that has devoured billions of pounds, and yet it always seems to be in trouble. My name is Jerry Robertson, and I spent my life turning around large-scale organisations. And I've always believed fundamentally that any business, no matter how large, can actually be made to work well. Last year, I faced the ultimate test of that belief. I was given one hospital, no money, and six months to try and reduce waiting lists and show everyone that even the NHS can work well. I had absolutely no idea what I was taking on. I thought I knew all about the NHS because it's permanently in the press. You know, you hear about huge debts, not enough doctors, not enough nurses, closures here, closures there. It's permanently in disarray is what it feels like. It's just a, it's a political nightmare. Clearly, this is not my territory. I know nothing at all about the medical profession. But in the end, good management is good management. It works whether you're, you know, running a small retail operation like a corner shop or you're running a large hospital. Rotherham's a good hospital. In fact, in its annual rating, it had received the highest grade that a hospital could receive. But, you know, the government are trying to run the NHS as a business. The patient can choose where he or she goes, and that in making that choice, the money for whatever procedure that they get carried out will go to that hospital. So, in a sense, it's become you know, you have to sell your goods. It has moved that way. I think in the chief executive's mind, this whole commercial reality was coming down the track towards him. And he was very frightened about this. My estimate is that we only need something like a 5% shift of patients to choose to go somewhere else. And uh, we are in deep financial trouble. I do think we're, we're almost drinking at the last chance saloon here. Brian had great ambitions for the hospital. He'd been implementing radical changes to the management structure. Waiting lists had started to come down. But Brian wanted more. He wanted a zero wait and had invited me in to see if I could speed up the process. Rotherham has an annual budget of about 130 to 140 million. It employs 3,300 people. And it just seemed like a very good place to try and find ways of reducing waiting lists that would apply not just there, but across the whole of the health service. As always, I started by, by listening to the staff. It's really important that we've got this hospital. I mean, I, there's, only, there's only this one in Rotherham, and then the other ones are at Sheffield. I mean, I don't, where would we be without it? There's a lot of bureaucracy. I think now that the NHS is run not just as a caring profession, but as a business, the, the paperwork has increased. I think you always get the feeling that you're chasing your tail. Uh, you've got to keep so many balls up in the air, it becomes difficult. This is uh, the last three or four days when I've not been here, and this is what I've uh, come back to. And in addition to that, there'll be uh, all the emails I'll need to respond to as well. But there's no getting away from it. It is a big bureaucracy. Really? I do. I do enjoy it, really. I think everybody moans about work at some point, but... You know, it's not that bad, really. Nursing staff, like auxiliaries, and we'll have a talk with those, you know, and we'll all have a little laugh sometimes. But with doctors, it's a bit different. You've got to, you've got to know your place. We have a sort of mixture of fear and respect about doctors, and I, and I was pretty aware from the beginning that I was going to have to overcome that. The NHS is very, very hierarchical. For example, we have a meeting every morning. The consultants sit on the back row. The registrars on the next row down. The, the SHOs, which are the junior doctors, on the next, and the nurses were pushed to the side. There was a kind of sense of a little club. I'd wandered into a little club, and there were rules in this little club. A lot of consultants don't like to be told what to do or don't like you to implement change. 
As consultants, we're appointed for 20, 25 years, and so we have responsibility for our patients for that time period. Most managers will come in and will be in the post for maybe one year, two years, three years. They implement changes, then they're gone, and that's the difficulty. The chief executive had recently survived a vote of no confidence from the consultants, which, had it been passed, could have meant that he lost his job. But he only had one thing on his mind that he felt was going to save the hospital. Waiting times are now really, really important for, for this organisation, as they are for all NHS organisations. If the, if the waiting times are long, the patients will choose to go somewhere else. If they choose to go somewhere else, we simply don't get the income we need to to pay for the services we provide, to pay our staff's wages. So it's now become a question of survival. So there it was. I had to get the waiting list down. I had six months to do it. I had no money to spend. The NHS has had waiting lists forever, so not exactly easy. The main centre of activity in a hospital, where you know, the money is earned, if that's a term that one wants to use, is in theatre. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. How are you doing? Thank you. So, theatre was clearly an area that I was going to concentrate on very early on. And there was a waiting list of 3,500 people. Rotherham Hospital had eight operating theatres, carrying out about 50 operations a day. So I, I, I knew I was going to have to get in there pretty quickly in establishing, just establish for myself how well or otherwise it was run. I'm not quite sure what I was expecting, but I think I was expecting it to be you know, a really busy place, that things were going to be humming and things were going to be happening and passing and people were going to be rushing around and it was going to be a real hive of activity. You know, there was, there was going to be enough space. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't like that at all. Well, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated because, you know, we're in a, uh, the theatres here and there's a sense that there's never enough theatre space available. But, you know, here's an empty theatre here and I've walked up the ward here. There's another one over here. It's empty, nobody in there. I'm assuming that the light's not on this, that's, that's not in use. That one is. This one's vacant. The theatre in here is vacant. So, you know, the sense that you have that there's a tremendous rush and there's a shortage of theatre space, so that just doesn't hang together somehow. I mean, we really have to find out what this means. Is this scheduling? Is it to do with just a particularly quiet time? It's hard to believe that. Is it simply to do with waiting on patients to come down? Are the, is, are the surgeons not here? What, what are the issues? But against a background of saying that one central crush point is theatres, this makes no sense at all. Well, it was pretty clear that this wasn't being managed. So my first port of call was to go and talk to the person who was supposed to be managing it, the theatre manager. That's empty this morning. That's what is that? Theatre 3, Thursday morning, it's, it's, it's an empty. unplanned list. There's right. not, there should There's not there. be anything in there this right. morning. Right. What about theatre? That's seven. That's an unplanned. That's also seven. It's planned to be empty. Yeah, seven and right. three should be empty this morning. Right, OK. Theatre 2 should be working. Right. And just again, why why are they planned to be empty? They're, just they're not staffed. They're not staffed. staffed. There's no surgeons um, that want those sessions at this moment in time, or have brought those sessions. <laughs> I've had a very stressful morning, but that's nothing <laughs> new to all. Why is it a stressful morning? With the messing around and arguing with surgeons and anaesthetists, basically, <laughs> about the emergency case. Uh, was, was there a bit of a... There's always, it's a, there's always a constant battle. Mm -hmm. It's like running a school for delinquents. Right. Is that just the pressure? What, what, what causes that? Um, I think it's the pressure that they're under and the mm. pressure to achieve the targets, mm. but, and they all just see their own little bit. They don't, mm. They don't look at the whole picture. Right. Um, 
it's just what, what they want. And as long as they're getting what they want at that time, it's all right, but they don't think about anybody else. I'd like surgeons and anaesthetists to be a little bit more flexible and stop blaming everybody else right. um, about flexibility of sessions um, and to communicate with each other Right. and, right. and with theatre staff. I was already surprised about how poorly utilised this theatre resource was. Honestly, that, that was just the beginning. As you okay. can see, there's quite a lot of empty town on a Friday afternoon. What's, what's that about? Um, well, as soon as we give a surgeon a Friday afternoon, as soon as he can, he'll offload, he or she will offload it, because at the end of the day, nobody wants to work Friday afternoon. But how and I think as well, on, on, the, on behalf of the surgeons, they don't like to do major cases on a Friday afternoon and leave them out, because they're, they're not here over the weekend. The fact that there are gaps in theatre, the fact that Friday afternoons are lost cause in terms of, you know, who are we kidding? Surgeons are buggering off for the weekend, they're not carrying out operations when they should be doing. We're talking about lists that are getting longer, we're talking about theatre time not available. You've got a feeling the whole thing's just, it's just half assed you know, it just needs to be, needs to be given some oomph. Clearly what this meant was that you could have carried out about 20 to 25 procedures, maybe more depending on what they were. And that, that would have bitten into the waiting list pretty substantially, pretty quickly. And in more human terms, it would have meant that people who, you know, were still in pain with their hips or their knees would have been seen earlier. I learned that this wasn't a problem that was unique to Rotherham. It happens across other hospitals. If I'd been running this hospital, it would be top of my list to sort out the Friday afternoon issue. I mean, clearly it's such an issue for capacity. So I, so I wanted to talk to the guy who did run the hospital, the chief executive, and, and talk to him about it. So I arranged to meet him in theatre on a Friday afternoon. And sure enough, it was empty. I've just been... Uh... I'm going to wander around theatres. God, it's, it's like the Marie Celeste out there. It's, what, on Fridays? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's historical, and uh, there, are, there are a few reasons for it. And the main ones are that um, Fridays is the day that the junior doctors, in particular, are, are drawn back to the central teaching parts, uh, to teaching hospitals, so that they're not here to assist uh, the surgeons on a Friday. So. Um, that tends to be a day, therefore, that the, the surgeons tend to take for their administration duties. The other reason why they, they don't do it on a Friday as well is, certainly in the, the main theatres here, the main, uh, the, where we do the majors, they don't, they don't do the majors on a, on a Friday because of weekend cover. Right. At this point in time, obviously, the amount of resource we have here allows us to do all our operating basically in four days. Yeah, there are a couple of theatres going on, but basically Monday to Thursday. I think as uh, if we start to increase the need for more theatres, clearly what I've got to try and avoid is building more theatres because they're an incredibly expensive resource for a hospital. Well, so Friday really is the only, way, only place to go. Mm. Now the issue is whilst we don't have the demand uh, for that, then, then it's... Uh, it's but, but we do have, we do have waiting lists. Yes, we do have waiting lists. We do have waiting lists. So, so, so the, the, de the demand is there. Yeah. It's impossible to defend, in my view. It, I, you know, I find it very difficult to defend from a, from a cold start that here we are, Friday afternoon, the place is empty. I, it isn't right. It, it, it isn't right. I, I know it isn't right. And I know we have to try and do something about it. It's just a matter of scheduling this. It's a, it's a matter of making sure that this precious resource, which is the absolute linchpin of waiting lists is used at the very least five days a week full time and that's just about scheduling that doctors you know have different time scales so that the time is actually used there's an argument frankly that you should use them for more than five days a week but at least five days a week <laughs> I just couldn't accept that, you know, that somehow it was the way it was. I was determined to find out, you know, what are the issues here? And as far as I could see, the only way to do that was actually get those involved in theatre together in one room and talk about it. How do we 
even start that process? Who needs to look at filling the time available and what it means from a cost point of view and how it all, how it all hangs together? The trouble is we don't even know what income generated for a day's operating and various specialties is at the but, moment. But we I can. Think, well, we can. We can. And I think we, we did, we did. What are you going to offer? What was clear was that they didn't even have the basic numbers. They didn't even know Absolutely. what you needed to know to make the decision. And I was very annoyed by that. Why isn't this debate happening in the hospital now? I think it happens, and I think people say, I want to do this, and then no, the I obstacles don't. prevent I it. I think the obstacles prevent I it. it. I do it's feel very frustrated by a sense of not quite knowing how to take it forward yet. That, you know, we're almost starting from scratch in terms of, you know, when we, when we get these numbers, f first of all, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed we haven't got the numbers, to be honest. I, th I thought somebody was going to say to me, yeah, of course, this is what we, this is what we haven't got them. But We've that... been asking for a year that we can have the numbers. So but but nobody's been asking more. consistently. You know, you, pe when people ask things, if they want the bloody answer, they will get it. They will get it. It's no good asking vaguely and then hoping, you know, three weeks. It won't bloody happen. You have to ask again the following day and say, well, you know, where is it? What, what's happened? You know, I wanted to know about the number. Where, and it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I, I get the feeling that we're going to have a real uphill struggle here. I hope that's wrong. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. If you've got the money, if you've got the money, you've got the equipment, you've got the staff, I don't think you've got a problem. I think you'll always have a problem because there are, even around the table, there are three distinct groups. And unless you break down the barriers between the surgeons, the anaesthetists and the nurses, it'll never work. There wasn't a structure that worked. And, and, and of, of course there is a structure. You know, you do have the chief executive, you do have the individual consultants in their various specialties, you do have some managers connected to some of those things, you have the anaesthetists separately, you have the nurses separately, you have a whole raft of things which, you know, report up to various separate bodies with lots and lots of bosses, but no structure at all of a chain of command that would work. Do you feel that you are running the hospital? Is that, does it feel like that as an NHS manager? Does... Yeah, I think it does. In, in all fairness, yes, I feel like I am running the hospital. Who do you think is in charge of the hospital? Um, I know what I should say. But um, I really think it's the consultants. I would say that the consultants and other frontline staff run the hospital for the benefit of the patients. Who do you think is in charge of the hospital? That's an interesting question, isn't it? A bit like asking who's in charge of the country, prime minister or civil servants. I suppose in theory the question is the chief exec, but I think often the feeling is it's actually the consultants. Who, in your view, who runs the hospital? The clinicians. Yeah, absolutely. I have no, no doubt about that. Yeah. In that sense, what's the purpose of management? We're here to facilitate the process. The main decision makers in the hospital are the medics the con and particularly the consultants. So at the end of the day, uh, I think most of them will have the attitude that if you're not there to help us, We'll go and find somebody who can. What, what was clear was <laughs> nobody really knew who was in control. Who's in charge of the consultants? Um, I don't think anybody is really, if I'm being perfectly honest. The doctors are managed by the managers, <laughs> whoever they are. I suspect in practice no one's in charge of the consultants. Who manages the clinicians? The clinicians are in control. Who manages them? The clinicians manage themselves. In theory, there's supposed to be a management and performance structure. I pretty much, my personal view would be that nobody really manages them. By and large, doctors thought managers got in the way more than helped. And certainly managers felt that doctors were kind of difficult and uncooperative. But in practice, you know, when I went and looked at child health, one manager in particular was desperate to do some very simple things to get the waiting list down from eight weeks to two weeks, you know, which in child health is pretty important. It's really simple, and I'm sure you're going to wonder why we've not done it before, but it's um, one new patient per consultant, per clinic for the next 15 weeks to get it down to two-week wait. Good God, is that Obviously, it? if we saw two new patients at each clinic, we'd have that backlog. 
cleared in or no cleared time in at seven all. seven weeks, yeah. Does that well, seem like a practical proposition to you? I think it's a practical um, proposition. You know, if everyone starts clinic on time and finishes at the time that they should, then I think we could fit that amount of work in. I believe that there is the capacity to do that. It's kind of not said, but but clearly clinics aren't always starting on time, are they? Is that, is that, is yeah, that a right. is, is that a big problem? I think for for some departments it it can be a, a, a big problem, but there are numerous factors that affect it. But um, you know, if if you're down for clinic and that's all all you're doing, you're not covering anything else, then mm. you should be should there be on time. time. It's frustrating because time goes on and mm. while that time is slipping away you, you could have made those decisions and put things in place to shorten that wait. I think Karen felt that within time that they, all, that they were contracted for the doctors could do a bit more than they did. I mean, I, I think she felt that, because she never said that, but I, I think she felt that. And, and that, you know, all she wanted them to do was to see a couple of extra patients per session and the waiting list would come down very rapidly from eight weeks to two weeks. The reason Karen couldn't get this plan off the ground was historical. In the NHS, managers are not in control of medical departments. It's a shared responsibility. You have Dr Mahajan, who's the clinical director, who theoretically is the one who represents the consultants within that specialty. You then have Karen, who's the manager, you know, who's the one who facilitates things, the one who takes care of whether the finance is available, and all, all that sort of technical stuff. I went to see Dr Mahajan, you know, just to try and get a handle on what the issue was. I think that there is a genuine feeling that more we give in, probably more we'll be asked to do. Is there an issue with some consultants who just don't want to do, you know, just don't want to make things happen think, and just aren't going to change, they're not going to do it and that's that? Is I that think that? change is, is difficult for a lot of people. Whenever you're trying to change anything, everybody thinks they're working to the same um, end result, but that's often not the case, but mm. I find, you know, you know, that obstruction that can come in just by delaying a process. I couldn't even begin to imagine what obstructions there could be. God, was, was I wrong? But obviously we'll have to work within the constraints of the resources that we have. So we've got the consultant contract, we've mm -hmm. got uh, uh, the EWTD, European Working Time Directive, and we've all got to work within the constraints of those. And then, of course, there is that, uh, that you know, that you can, ex you can stretch things only that far. Mm. It's not about the consultants. It's about those people that you're out of service. It's not about them. I, d I do think there is a sense among consultants that it is about them, actually. That is the heart of the problem. You've got this Im hugely important part within the structure that has the capacity to say, sod off. Ah, oh, Karen's just such a breath of fresh air. She's can do. I'd employ her tomorrow, frankly, and I, she'd probably be great to have a lot more money in doing something outside. She, she's great, and she, she actually fills me full of hope. My immediate instinct with Dr. Mahajan was, was uh, a million reasons why not. You know, that, that's one's instant, instant feeling, and, and it, they couldn't be more opposite. You know, and, and there are people who are like that. Having said that, to be fair to her, I think that in her heart of hearts, she is willing to give it a go. I don't know if she knows what that means yet, but it's interesting, isn't it? You know, the, the first impression is immediately that, oh, you know, you've got this regulation and that regulation, you've got this thing from Europe, and you've got a thousand reasons why you'll never do it. And we're actually doing the best we can, and we've done better than we've ever. Yeah, it's just the opposite. The one thing that's absolutely clear, you know, when you compare the two sides of this equation, the kind of management and the consultants, is that management's very excited about making this happen, and the consultants are very excited about making sure that it's going to be difficult. <laughs> this plan of Karen's was so right. It was so simple, so straightforward, so producing such a brilliant outcome for so little effort. I was determined that we were going to get it underway. And, and you know, if Karen couldn't break the logjam with the consultants, then I was going to have to. We are down to eight weeks now. That is the latest figure that we have. Is that right, Karen? You've just checked that. Yeah. Um, eight weeks is, is, is what we have at the moment. What, what would it take for each of you to do to, to get the waiting list down to either zero the, or close um, to zero? Okay. One, one new patient per consultant would clear that backlog in, yeah. 15, in 15 weeks. In 15 weeks. If you see two new patients per consultant per week, 
we cleared it out in seven weeks. Are we are we happy? I mean, I mean there's a group of us here, but we, we happy that you, our colleagues are up for this. Even the ones that aren't here, they're they're up for looking at this exercise. I think every, yeah, I think everybody is happy to to look at this exercise. Oh yes, I'm, I mean we'll we'll sit down again now mm -hmm. and look at it once, uh, go through it again with, with the, everyone around the table. Uh, another thing, another few barriers that I'm, I'm just sort of trying to think of is space. Uh, mm -hmm. How we are going to provide the space for all this extra work that we are going to undertake. We were thinking of maybe utilizing the registrars to do more uh, clinical work than what they have been doing already. Um, and, and, and I think that is one of the issues that we will be looking at. Um, but the, the space might be a bit of a barrier there and we've got to look at how, how we are going to provide two offices. It sounds like you've got to pull this together and come up with a, a list of things that we need to try and make try and make happen. It will require discussion. We may have to go backwards and forwards a few times. Good, Karen. That uh, that was a bit uh, <laughs> lacking in enthusiasm. I thought we got there, but did it feel to you that we were hugely enthusiastic for doing this? I think the problem was that we only had three consultants out of eight present and mm -hmm. I think more of them around the table would have made for a better discussion mm -hmm. and um, yeah I think they, they I think they do accept that's what we've got to do and mm -hmm. it's a really easy solution but it doesn't always mean people will be enthusiastic about an easy solution. Do you think we could have made the decision just now? Well, I could have made the decision, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I feel it was an easy solution and that everybody could get on board with it very quickly and we could have started that work within the next week or two. What's oh, that? It's, it's such an extraordinary... I just find it such, such an extraordinary thing. It would drive <laughs> me to distraction. It really would. What we're talking about was children who needed either some kind of medical attention or some kind of medical investigation. Getting that waiting down from eight weeks to two weeks was the prize. I mean, what a prize. So I was now in the position, which is a position I hate, where all I could really do was wait. Just wait and see what it was now going to happen. At this point, I'd been going to the hospital two days a week for a month. So I was getting in there and it was very clear that there was a huge lack of genuine crossover amongst the various disciplines that have to work together in this you know, fairly complicated business. And I, I particularly wanted to look at the effect of that in the theatre, you know, in surgery where people really do have to come together. There's no doubt, and, and it was absolutely clear to me that getting theatre right was crucial to getting waiting lists down. <laughs> So I gowned up and went and spent a day watching orthopaedic surgery. Orthopaedic surgery has some of the longest waiting lists in the NHS. We're just going to uh, spend, the, spend the session with you. That's right, and, yes. Uh, just going to just observe, see how it all works, see, yes. see how it happens. Yeah, well, we've just, um, we're just about to start. Let's see what's happening. Amanda Rees specialises in knee surgery and that morning her first patient was a, a young girl who'd got a torn knee cartilage, who arrived you know, tw 20 minutes late for surgery because she'd had to see the uh, physiotherapist. So we weren't off to a great start. While well, the patient's just arrived, it's 20 past. If this is a precious resource, when we're not we're really not managing it as a precious resource, we're very casual about it. Okay, to start. What was clear that once the patient was in surgery got underway, you know, the quality of the treatment was amazing. I mean, and actually, that sounds a bit pompous, actually quite a privilege to see what was happening and, and, and the quality and skill that was obviously being applied. I had no question about the quality. I, I really was beginning to have some doubts about the time.
Well, so far this morning, we've had operating potential time of an hour and a half, and we've been operating for 25 minutes. That's the actual time that Amanda's been operating on a patient out of an hour and a half, a potential hour and a half. If that's in any way representative, it means we are hugely underutilizing her time. For a variety of reasons, you know, patient not arriving, some hold up and, and anesthesia, I mean, the whole, the whole, the whole gambit of things. And I'm sure some of it will be not capable of change, but it strikes me, 25 minutes out of an hour and a half, that can't be right. The next patient was a, a rugby player who damaged his knee and uh, needed some work done on his cartilage. Amanda had her usual three and a half hour session available to her that morning, and she was beginning to get a bit behind schedule. We've kind of overloaded this list a bit because of the, it's probably a little bit more than should be on it. We're probably going to overrun time-wise. Right, exactly what we thought. He's got a large tear of his cartilage. Quite tough tissue to cut through this, so. At this point, the actual operation itself was completed, but we were still waiting for the patient to come round from the anaesthetic. So, obviously, the next patient was kept waiting for the anaesthetist to come and see them. Well, it's extraordinary, actually, because in the first three hours, you know, if you take the potential starting time as 9 o'clock, and it's now just gone 12, and Amanda's operating, of the three hours, under an hour has been spent actually cutting. You know, when you think that Amanda's got a waiting list of up to three months, and some people even longer than that, it, it makes me feel that, you know, somebody needs to grip this thing and plan it. You know, it, it is ridiculous that our most expensive resource by far, our consultants, are getting to spend a third of the already precious time they have actually operating. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, in any other field, you would... It's laughable. It's just not good enough. After you. First, I wanted to find out why the anaesthetist held up the schedule. It is because I need to do most mostly consultants themselves. They they have parity in ownership of the patient, so to speak. So mm -hmm. for an anaesthetist here, it is totally normal to see the patient before the anaesthetic, be present through the entire anaesthetic, and look after the patient until the patient is fully recovered from the effects of the anaesthetic. Mm -hmm. And none of these tasks is normally delegated, but not happily delegated. And that's where the crack point comes, really. And then, what Rolf explained was that it was at the end of the operation and the beginning of the next that things really slowed down. By that time, the next patient is in the anaesthetic room and nothing happens because the anaesthetist isn't there, because the anaesthetist is looking after this patient. So you're talking about at least half an hour of totally dead time for the surgical team. How would you, how would you overcome that? The easy, quick, quick fix solution to that would be an early recovery team, which is a mobile anaesthetist who is not attached to any theater, they would come in here as soon as, let's say, the next patient arrives or the surgeon starts to close the wound and allow this anesthetist to go and put the next patient to sleep. Have you talked to uh, anesthetists here about? Yes. And what's the, what's the reaction to that? I don't think it's a very good idea. Because? Because it's, um, it's the mental step of giving up ownership of your patient at the end of the operation, which they're not happy with. I had no doubt that Rolf's idea was a good one and, and needed exploration. But I thought maybe there's an easier way of reducing waiting lists in orthopaedics. Well, one idea might be to just give the surgeon more time to operate. I just going to run through uh, the, uh, the timing of the last list that we, we observed you, you yes. doing. Now, uh, at 11.20, we've been going for two hours 20. And you were actually operating for 57 minutes. Why didn't Amanda just operate for longer? Why, why was she stuck with three and a half hours when it clearly wasn't enough? What determines that? The theatre staff, they come in at half age. Mm -hmm. They work for eight hours with an hour for lunch. So that translates into two, three and a half hour sessions. Have you tried to, to change that from your own point of view? I have. I mean, I've, I've been saying for the last 10, 12 years, I've, I've sat on the 30 users committee. Why not make the time of the list fit the operations that need to be done? I, I mean, it just strikes me that the very fact that there is a theatre users committee means that bugger all will happen. 
I and know. I, I just, I just think, oh god, they've got a theatre users committee. That's it. Nothing's going to change. I, I mean, I, I have said this like a broken record until I'm bored with saying it. I feel so thick. I've really missed that. I mean, I, I, I really have. I've just missed it. That 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 is such a constraint as part of. You know, I haven't missed the fact that we need to be more flexible in theatres. I haven't missed that. But I've missed the fact that part of the reason it's so rigid is you've got this eight hour day with an hour for lunch, and that means two, three and a half hour sessions, and that's it. That's got to be, that's got to be alterable. So here we were with the consultant clearly feeling that the, the nurses were responsible for this ridiculous schedule, so, so I went to see the nurses. One of the things that has come up very uh, sharply is to say that actually the reason that the sessions are divided into two, three and a half hour sessions. Is that nurses work an eight hour day, they get an hour for lunch, and that that's... <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, when did you last have an hour for lunch, Diane? Did I tell you the last time we had an hour for lunch? Did you get any lunch at all this week? Uh, Tuesday we got our lunch at half past three. For how long? Good God, is that um, right? So we had 20 minutes at half past three and then we sorted out kit that we needed to sort out for the rest of the week. You don't finish at half past 12. You don't start at two o'clock, although the lists run theoretically mm. to that time, and you don't finish at half past five. It would be nice, but you don't, and you stay dedication from this department. Nobody walks out before a list's finished, do they? No. I've tried it. No, yeah. I haven't. <laughs> Just patient, yeah. The patient's patient. asleep. But it's half past five. Leave them there till tomorrow. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Your time's up. Your time's yeah. Up. I mean, on Tuesday it was eight o'clock start, and they went on a quarter past twelve Wednesday morning. Right. That's dedication. Right. I'm actually struck by the fact that you've got a peculiarly f fixed system in an odd sort of way. You know, you've got pretty rigid days set for individual individual surgeons. The surgeons have outside commitments, they have yeah. clinics to run and, and everything like that, so they are giving <coughs> sessions Jeez, around their other work. Yeah. Well, once again we were back in the position where everyone was blaming everyone else, so I thought the only thing to do was to get some of the people from theatres together and really hammer things out. There is a sense of, of separateness, isn't there? there? There really is a sense of separateness, that somehow we could do it, but that they wouldn't or they can't or, you know, they're difficult. There, there is that sense. It's a cultural thing because, mm. because it's, it, according to our Secretary for Health Patricia Hewitt, it, it, the NHS is a consultant-led service. So how do you going to how do you going to get um, ten orthopedic surgeons, ten general surgeons, fifteen anaesthetists organised, who all are independent practitioners who have no boss who can tell them how to do things and and tell them what to do and what to change? I mean, that's just like looking after our primary school class. I mean, how difficult is that? It's like herding cats. Isn't it? <laughs> I think there is a resistance to change as well. Mm, yeah. The problem is that you have to get so many different people to agree, mm. and you get a few people who who don't like the idea of change and aren't willing to try it, and they tend to get ve get allowed to veto things. I actually, as an outsider, I actually get a sense of antagonism. That you know, doctors talk about nurses, and nurses talk about doctors, and everyone talks about anaesthetists. By the way, <laughs> there's always a sense of antagonism. Professionals don't talk to each other, really. We've got a hierarchical system, mm -hmm. so a person at one level will not speak to someone lower down. So even if you'd got a good idea, when you think about the people that you would have to influence to do it, often you can't get to those people. Mm -hmm. It's got to go through someone else, and. I think that's a big blocker. We have very little ability to actually make things happen ourselves. It's, there's a, such a channel mm. of, or not quite bureaucracy, but there's a channel of loop hoops you have to jump through to enable something to happen. It's actually quite difficult to get something to happen spontaneously. Oh, it's I, I think it's impossible. I mean, I, I think it's close to impossible. I mean, seriously, if there's one issue that jumps out at me again and again and again, is that a group of willing people that somehow don't... There's no way to make a thing happen. Whose job is that? We, we, we sit every week as a team on a Wednesday morning and we look at causes of delays and everybody looks at what the problems are and then they go back 
and see how they can rectify it. But Pat, we've been discussing this as 30 it. users yeah, for 10 years. Yeah. We've been talking for the same time about late starts and late yeah. finishes, and absolutely nothing, nothing has changed. changed. We sit in a lot of committees that discuss the, the certain issues over and over again. And I think one of the, the main problems is that there is no person with whom the responsibility ultimately stops, who will make a stand and say, look, I'm going to make this decision, we're going to do it this way because this is the right thing to do, and it's my name on the line if it doesn't work out. Absolutely no one here was doing the management thing, which was seeing what the issues were, looking for the most simple solution and making it happen. No one has that responsibility here. So I was going to have to do it. I, 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 I felt I was going to have to identify what the issue was, which is clearly more time in operating theatres, and I was going to have to be the one who made it happen, including the use of the time available on a Friday afternoon that wasn't being used. And in child health, I, I really wanted to support Karen's very simple plan of getting consultants to see two more patients per clinic to get the waiting list down from eight weeks to two weeks. I was concerned that the consultants might get in the way of making that happen. So for Karen's plan to really get off the ground, to really work, I really had to give it another push. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Morning. Go and see you. Nice fresh day. Lovely. Beautiful, isn't it? So what's been happening? Where have we, where have we got to with our project? We just need to have buy some time to discuss all the options. I need to discuss those with the consultants who, whose lists we are talking about. Mm. It can't just happen overnight, I'm afraid. But actually, some, some of the stuff that you have to do, you know what it is now. Um, it, it is, but you know, it takes time to get, get the um, medical records on board, to ch change our booking rules, to get people to come to those clinics to move them around. But I have this feeling, because we've hit it again and again and again and dealing with things in, in the hospital, is that somehow things have to be carefully thought through 57 times when actually what we're asking for and what you need, you know needs to be done is actually just pretty bloody straightforward and it's about mm. getting the consultants, just do it. Well, you know? it, that's right, I it agree is. with you completely that it's simple, but it has to, people have to understand that this is what it is and they should sign up to it. And for that, I need a period of consultation. Mm. I'm afraid I, I cannot, it doesn't work like that with clinicians that you go to them and tell them, look here, you've got to do this. I'm afraid I, that's not my style. I like to have proper consultation with my colleagues and get them on board, get them to sign to it so that it's, there's ownership and everybody will then deliver. How long will that take? Well, uh, shall we say two weeks? Yeah, I mean, I really don't mind if we're talking two weeks. I, I really yeah. don't mind. That's not, that's not unreasonable. But I'm all the time kind of caught in, in, in dealing with things here that there is this sense that, you know, you have to consult you have, to have another two weeks and you go another four weeks and then there's, you know, there's a meeting but it's not until, you know... <laughs> kind of just uh, to... <laughs> well, that's right. I think you only suffer yeah. the same frustrations yeah. that we suffer. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, consultants are almost like judges and they decide how they are going to deliver. We have to set targets, but yeah. the mode of delivery, to some extent, they, have, they, they decide. I wondered if this was a problem that chief executives in the NHS came up against on a regular basis. The move between thinking that you know the answer and getting someone to try it is huge. You know, the answers aren't complicated, are they? You know, it either works or it doesn't work and you try it for a month. Getting that move underway, I, I find amazingly frustrating. I, I do find it frustrating. Yeah. Every consultant is quite idiosyncratic in the way they organise their services, the way they provide their services, and they really do not like that being interfered with. They really do not. And it's part of the culture. It's part of the culture. It's not, not part of the culture of this hospital. I think it's part of the culture pretty much universally across the NHS that you will find the same sorts of issues in most hospitals. It was obvious that for a very long time the consultants had been a law unto themselves. That was starting to change, but you could see the battle a chief executive would have. Do you know, at that point, and it's, it really is pretty unusual for me, I, I, I began to have some doubts. I, I really felt for the first time that perhaps I'd bitten off more than I could chew. I 
find it very draining. There's a sense of negativity. There, there, there is a sense, well, it's worse than that. There's actually a sense somewhere that in there people want to do the right thing, but there's no way that you can pull them all together to make it happen. I think maybe I'm at the, the, the low point, and, but I do feel that very little will happen here, and my God, I, I hope I'm wrong, because the whole object of the exercise is to actually show that things can be done. I hope I'm wrong, but right now, it doesn't feel like I am. It had become clear to me, and it had been confirmed by my experience in child health, that people in the NHS had simply lost the ability to just do it. And I was concerned that I could get sucked into that because you often are sucked in by the experience in the place that you're working. And I realised I really had to stay above that if I was going to achieve anything here. I really was at a low ebb. And then something of a minor miracle happened. I heard that in Theatre 11 there was a surgeon who was, who was breaking all the rules. It turned out that I wasn't the only one who couldn't understand why time slots were so rigid so that surgeons often had very little time to carry out operations. There was an orthopaedic surgeon who'd found a solution to the problem. Manjit Bamra operated a single seven-hour shift. His specialty is hips, shoulders, the knees. What uh, the problem in this guy is, um, that's the top of his tibia, yeah. and he's, he's literally been walking with the leg bent inwards, so he's worn this away completely. So what we're going to do is to basically get a flush surface perpendicular to the foot. And then on the other side, everything I'm going to do now is to shape it into that shape so that this will literally go and cover the surface up. You know, watching Manjid work was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. And I think it was also telling that Manjit had some of the shortest waiting times in orthopaedics. What, what attracted you to this in the first place? How did you what, uh, end up doing this? What, knees or orthopaedic surgery? Orthopaedics in general. Um, I think it's, uh, by and large, it's very, very clean surgery. Okay. If you look at some other branches of surgery, like uh, uh, general surgery, you always have a lot of uh, either feces to deal with or pus to deal with. Just didn't appeal to me. And then the other bit that I did was uh, cardiac surgery. And there were just too many prima donnas there, so <laughs> I couldn't do it. Impactor. We're just having a problem getting it seating flush. It's still off there, isn't it? Look at the notch. Down on this side. Yep. Okay. Okay, so those are the metal bits. And this is the polyethylene that goes in. Okay, so once that's gone down there, it's locked. So that's neat. Will then work like that. Another one done. Manjit had taken it all into his own hands. The seven hour list was working because he and his team made it happen. We've fought long and hard for this, mm. and we know what we can do. We know that we've, we've got from half past eight till half past four to get everything done. Compared to looking at other surgeons, there's a kind of sense of urgency here. There's a feeling that, you know, things are happening quickly. It's... I think it's because we do this often and there isn't the time to hang around. Necessary. There isn't the time and you will probably notice that, you know, as I'm coming towards the end of the procedure, I will normally say to the girls, send for the next, uh, next patient because mm. 
the amount of time wasting that occurs, you know, just sending for the patient, bringing the patient over, checking the patient, bring them mm. to theatre, that can all be happening whilst well, I'm yeah. finishing the last procedure. Right. What I had to find out was whether, you know, all day lists could make a difference to waiting times. Sometimes we struggle to keep up um, because he is fast. Yeah, he is. Um, but I think every surgeon would get at least one more case through if they write as an all day list, and some of the surgeons may get two through. I mean, I can run this list, and the girls are run ragged, everybody's run ragged but it's a satisfying thing to do. At the end of it, you know, we'll have you know, done nine cases or whatever it is. I could equally well do three cases yeah, and be paid yeah, exactly yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you sort of think, well, where is the incentive to carry on doing this? Right, so we'll do the uh, right hip on this patient. I've dislocated the hip, so the patient's lying on his side, so the leg has gone through another 90 degrees. Right. Let's reduce it again, uh, Liz. That's the hip back in its socket. It's so rigid. Manjit had some of the shortest waiting lists in orthopedics, okay. but he was thinking of leaving the hospital. Having made the decision, well, you know, it could be better elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, he suddenly starts seeing how many things are not going to change and the brick walls are just hitting you. And you sort of think, do I really want to carry on doing this for the rest of my life, or do I sort of say, this is the last chance I've got, and I'll take it? Change is really hard to make happen in, in this kind of organisation. What the all-day session meant was that more patients were being seen, waiting lists were reduced, more money was coming into the hospital, but Manjid was alone in orthopaedics doing this all-day session. It just struck me as one of those brilliantly simple ideas ignored. As always, it was the people actually doing the job who, who had the answers. But in the NHS, it was almost impossible to get ideas moving off the shop floor. And I, I just felt I had, to, I had to do something to make it possible for people to get their ideas into action. Six weeks in, and I was fighting the hospital's waiting list on several fronts. In orthopaedics, I was gonna take up the cause of all day lists. And in child health, I was trying to persuade the doctors to see two extra patients per clinic. And I was still trying to sort out the thing that was really bugging me, those empty theaters on a Friday afternoon. Hey. Come on in. Can I get your tea? Then the general manager for theater came up with an idea to staff up a theatre on a Friday afternoon that was available to any surgeon who needed it at that time. I would love to staff up those theatres so that they're... so that they're staffed and equipped and ready, so they're, if you like, blank canvases ready for somebody to paint on. But there's a name person. And then that idea was taken to the man who could really make it happen, who was the finance guy. I'll just go through and understand sort of the detail and assumptions behind this, but in principle, it makes an awful lot of sense. That produced a ray of hope. We were close to getting something permanent on a Friday afternoon in theatre, but of course, nothing definite yet. In child health, I'd given Dr. Mahajan just two weeks to try and get her, her consultant colleagues to agree to the plan, which was for them to see two extra patients per clinic. And that would reduce the waiting list from eight weeks down to two. But the general manager of child health wasn't very optimistic. I feel frustrated today. I feel like it's going pear-shaped. Although she, she promised we'd meet our objective within two weeks, I think it's proving much more difficult to do that. And, and, and sat here today, I don't think it's going to be achievable within two weeks. I underestimated just how difficult the consultants would be. In fact, Dr. Mahajan herself was so worried, she went to see the chief executive. I think there has been some resistance from my colleagues. Right, what kind of resistance have, have you had? Has everybody got a problem with it, or is it down to one or two? It will ultimately boil down to one or two. Okay. Uh, what I'm doing at the moment is, uh, is talking to, in, uh, to them individually now, right. going over the plans, exploring their um, 
there are issues with it, basically. Okay. My worry is that if somebody comes to you right. and you probably say something different to what I'm saying, okay. then we are not all singing the same hymn sheet. Absolutely. So you want me to make sure that, that uh, if anybody tries to bypass you to get to me, I bat them back and, uh, and I let, let you get on with leading. That's right. Okay, that's, that's right. fine. Yes. That was smart of Dr Mahajan to go and see Brian. She knew she was going to have to fight this. She knew she was going to have resistance and she had to cover off the back door, which is exactly what she did. And from there, Dr. Mahajan continued to drum up support. Hello. Hi. Right. I just, I just came down to see you for a few minutes. A week later, and the time was up. If Dr. Mahajan had failed to convince her colleagues, frankly, we were going to be back to square one. How have you been getting on? Very well. Yeah? Mm, where, yes. Where have we got to? We've got all my uh, consultant colleagues on board with the project. All of them? All of them, oh, well yes. Well done you. Yes, well done yes. you. Well, you, you, were, you were quietly confident that you probably would, weren't yes, you? Yes, I was, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, good. Yeah. that's good. But I'm very pleased that the, we are all working together now. Right. And we are ready to start phasing the clinics in. When, when will that start? Well, Monday, the first clinic. I'd really underestimated Dr. Mahajan. In my heart of hearts, I, I didn't believe she could do it. But she, she really took it on board. She saw it as something that she was going to make happen. She handled it intelligently. She covered off all the obstacles. She was totally committed to it. And that passion carried it through. It, it was a brilliant exercise in, 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 in management. And so the following Monday, the extra patients were already been seen. Two months later, waiting times in child health fell from eight weeks to two. Come to me for a minute, sweetie. Come here. Yes, you look good, aren't you? Here at last was something concrete. You know, we had a result. But in a way, what it did was it served to highlight what was missing here. The role of management, which is to create an atmosphere in which things can happen, things will happen, you can do things, was missing, or it felt like it was missing. And it's essential to have that feeling if you're to achieve things. It's, it's not a passing thing. It has to be there on a permanent basis. Someone has to create that atmosphere, and it wasn't being done. And I had to tackle that, and I knew that was going to be very, very difficult. This time, the doctors and managers tell me what they really think about one another. The surgeons throw tantrums and the anaesthetists throw tantrums regularly. They've probably got three O-levels and they are managing people who've got five or six degrees each. And my frustration with the chief executive boils over. This so sums up the problem that I have with Brian. If you want to know what I thought after two months in the NHS, visit our website, open2.net. And Jerry continues his mission at 9 tomorrow on BBC Two. Next tonight, trust me, I'm a healer. 